right, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, as we like to do on Mondays, um, we like to have upstream projects talk about where they're at right now and new initiatives. So if you have one, reach out, let me know, and we'll give you the podium. And today we're giving the podium to a new CNCF sandbox project called Keylime that I know this much about. Um, so very little. So I'm really interested in hearing from um, Luke Hines and Axel Simon, both Red Hatters who've been working on this project, um, about what it does, where it's going, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and um, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So please guys, take it away. Sure. Um, I, I guess I'll start quickly. So my name's Axel Simon. I'm part of the uh, Red Hat Office of the CTO. I work with Luke in the uh, uh, security team of the Emerging Technologies Department. So we're basically focusing on all the new technologies that's going to shape what's happening in the next in the next couple of years to to a horizon a bit beyond that. We extend sort of our thought to sort of five and then even maybe ten years as we sort of try and really take the long view. But most of the stuff we look at is more on the horizon of a couple of years. Um, and I, I've been working on on a few open source projects that are security focused. Keyline being one of them. Um, prior to that, I was doing quite a lot of work on, on blockchains, and it's not entirely irrelevant here because um, both have things to do with distributed systems and how you have multiple systems and you try and sort of maintain an integrity of all of them. So, as you can guess, I, I have an interest for um, sort of distributed systems and how you keep all of those things working together nicely. Um, yeah, so that's about it for me. Luke, do you want to take the floor? Sure, yeah. So, I'm Luke Hines um, from the UK. I also work in the CTO department alongside Axel, and uh, I've worked in many open source projects, or typically focused on security, and I'm the current uh, project team lead for Keyline. Right. So I'll um, I'll introduce you all to, to Keylime, and you may be wondering what well what is Keylime, except for you know beyond a, a cool logo and a nice name. So um, it all comes from a research paper uh, in the beginning of, of 2016, called Bootstrapping and Maintaining Trust in the Cloud. So that's an issue that you might have run into. Um, it's hard to know what state the machine you boot in the cloud is in, really, um, if you don't have anything to base it off from. That is, you may be told that this machine is running, I don't know, say CentOS 7, but it's hard to know exactly what it's running. And so um, you need a way to bootstrap confidence in that state of the machine. And this is what the research paper fundamentally is about. It was it was written by Nabil and Charles uh, at MIT. And so later on that same year in 2016, they, they came up with a prototype which would become Keyline. Um, and over time, that kept, that kept moving forward. And eventually, in 2018, uh, moved all to GitHub and got a community starting around it. I think Luke started uh, participating around that time, maybe a bit earlier. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, basically, the project really gets started and goes from the prototype to uh, to an open source community project. And very recently, uh, about a month ago, um, thanks to Luke's efforts, uh, the Keyline was uh, accepted as a CNCF sandbox project. So we now are part of the Cloud Native uh, Foundation, which um, is interesting because Keyline really much, very much is dedicated to the idea of, of you know, multiple nodes and how you, you maintain trust in that. So, so what exactly does Keyline do? Well, Keyline tries to provide three main things. Uh, the first of it is remote remote attestation. So that's the capacity to check without being at the actual computer that is running it, that it is in a state you believe, uh, in a state you can check. So you want to attest from afar remotely, obviously, that the machine is in the state you, you think it is. And to do that, um, we, do, we use two things. Uh, we can measure the boot to check what it boots into, and then we can measure the runtime using this Linux subsystem called IMA. And we'll get back to that a bit later. So that's the first part, um, remotely checking that a node is uh, is in a state, you, you, you checking on the state of a node remotely. The second one is encrypted payloads. It's once you can check that the node is in a trustworthy uh, state, then you can send it payloads that are uh, encrypted and that it can decrypt. And that can be used for several things, but basically you, you, can, you can bootstrap your node uh, and give it extra information, uh, including secrets, and that's, that's very useful in these day and age. This Always secrets, secrets to maintain, to make, sorry, to manage, and this is um, this enables you to do that. And lastly, uh, we have a revocation framework 
which makes which enables you to uh, to manage with the failure of a node. So if a node no longer is in a, in a state you like, uh, you can fail that node, and we've got a framework around that to take several actions. Um, so the three work together, but they're all based on one fundamental uh, root of trust, which is uh, a TPM. So TPM, for those who might not know, is the Trusted Platform Module. It's a chip that's found on the vast, on, yeah, vast majority of modern computers, and essentially all servers. Lots of laptops have them too. You can even get one for your Raspberry Pi if you want to. Um, essentially, it's a chip that uh, is capable of doing some simple uh, fundamental cryptographic operations, and one of them is measuring um, the um, measuring different aspects of the system as it boots. And we use that extensively uh, for Keylime to uh, to be able to check remotely the state of the of the system. So let's look a bit more at what the Keylime architecture uh, looks like. So we've got two sides here. One of them is the is the node on the left, the machine you are actually trying to check, uh, and on which we run an agent, which is the Keylime agent. Uh, you can see that Keylime agent connects to the TPM or the virtual TPM. We'll get more into that later, but basically for now it's just TPMs. Um, and that can run in a container, in a virtual machine, directly on the machine. Um, we can, all of those things are, all of those uh, use cases are, are um, possible. And, uh, and it will communicate over a network to the Keyline verifier. So the Keyline verifier is the one that actually checks the integrity of the node on which the Keylime agent runs. The Keylime agent just sends the quotes and the Keylime verifier will, will check those quotes. Um, and then we have a third component, which is the registrar, which will, um, which will manage, which will store the, uh, the states of the, of the machines, the remote machines, and, the, uh, and what we, the, the state we expect them to be in, their cryptographic identity, that sort of stuff. Um, some of you might have picked up on the fact that in the middle, our network doesn't have to be trusted. So often these days, every time we do something that is security related, we'll try to always be uh, using a TLS uh, encrypted connection. Um, in this case, it's not strictly necessary. It may be desirable, but it's not necessary because the Keylime agent doesn't do anything really, but, uh, well, it does a lot of things obviously, but um, fundamentally what it does is make available a quote from the TPM. And the TPM, the, 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 the TPM's quote is uh, cryptographically signed and nothing else on the system is able to uh, to forge that signature. So if the, if the signature got modified along the way on the untrusted network, that would be immediately visible. So basically we, we have some protection in the, in the capacity of the TPM to, uh, to sign uh, cryptographically valid quotes. And so we don't necessarily need a trusted network. Uh, having one can be desirable, again, uh, maybe to protect you know, against some other failures, but, but it's not necessary, which, which is an interesting little um, extra aspect of, of Keyline. But so fundamentally, those three aspects, the agent on the node, uh, the verifier on your machine from which you are trying to verify things, the registrar to sort to store all the information relative to your node, and your nodes usually because you'll have several. How does remote attestation work? Well, it's as I started describing it previously, but it's really quite basic. You, um, you so you, you request attestation uh, before you, you send your workload. You ask the verifier, could you please check this node? The verifier uh, talks to the agent, which requests a quote from the TPM and then sends this uh, quote back to the verifier. Now you have two possibilities. Either um, the quote is validated, everything's okay, your node has not been compromised, has not changed, it's in a state that you uh, believe to be good um, and, you, and you are okay with that state. And then uh, automatically the, um, the verifier might send to the agent an encrypted payload and it can run automatically. Otherwise, if it fails uh, its validation, then you will get a revocation event and the uh, node on which the agent is running here will be cordoned off and will be um, removed from the group. Um, let's go a bit more into the, uh, the idea of, of running encrypted payloads. So once the machine passes its attestation uh, with the verifier, then we can send it back the encrypted payload, which will uh, give it access to some secrets. Um, we have a little example on the right here where we have like some, some secrets, like we have a password and we have some local actions we want to take. Um, that, for instance, will only be executed if the machine passes its, uh, its attestation. In this case, it'll, it'll receive the payload, it'll have uh, what it needs to decrypt it, and then it'll start running the actions inside the payload. Um, the, payload the, um, the, the protocol for, um, for exchanging the secrets is, is a three-part key der deviation, derivation protocol, I think, but mistake there. Um, Luke might be able to explain it better than I am. I, you know, don't, don't push me on that one. I'm not quite clear on it exactly enough yet. But um, 
but th it's pretty cool. It basically means you can have a uh, you can you can ship a node, for instance, with a secret on it that it can't read because it doesn't yet have the keys, and then later on reveal the keys to it so that it can read stuff. So you can you can embed secrets in, for instance, a master image that you will push onto all your nodes, and yet be sure that uh, bearing being able to break modern cryptography, the node won't have access to the secrets until you decide that it is okay for it to have access. Uh, we mentioned prior also that we were able to do runtime monitoring. So not just checking that the system boots into a good state, but that the system remains in a good state over time. Uh, you can basically think of this as like a tripwire. If anything uh, changes on the system, it will trip the tripwire, and we will have an event telling us of that. Um, so for that, we use the uh, integrity measurement architecture, which is a Linux security subsystem. Um, every syscall is measured and extended into the TPM. Um, but this is done asynchronously, so it's it's not blocking and it doesn't slow down uh, the system. And then the um, the state is compared remotely uh, with what is expected. Um, and if there's a problem, then we can fail the node. So, for instance, if somebody executes um, a script that wasn't planned, wasn't supposed to be uh, executed on the node, um, then that will trip the IMA uh, monitoring, and Keyline will be able to set off an event, and you can make decisions on that. Um, again, here we have uh, this idea of, of using the TPM quotes to check that that cannot be fabricated um, to, to, to use that as a protection against basically say uh, a, a system will be taken completely over and would start sending fake quotes. In this case, it shouldn't be able to do that because the TPM, um, it won't be able to get the real, um, it won't be able to fake the quotes from the TPM uh, compared to what we're expecting remotely because we have our, our copy remotely. We use also a nonce here for those who are interested to make sure that quotes can't be replayed and that they're fresh. So what happens in the case of revocation? Well, um, let's say, for instance, that we uh, realize there's an, there's an event on node C and there's a problem and we want to fail node C. Well, so what we might do, for instance, is uh, revoke node C certificate with our certificate authority um, and then send this revocated uh, event to all, all the other nodes. And this is basically what we can do with Keylime, which is once node C is compromised, we cannot trust it anymore to take any action um, properly. Uh, we have to assume that it's, it's, it's uh, dead and gone and that we're not gonna be able to get anything out of it. And so all our actions are basically gonna be about cordoning off node C and modifying the behavior of all the other nodes. So you really have to think about it that way. And that's really the main, the main idea. And so here, um, the revocation events can be um, what we just uh, mentioned here, for instance, like removing, revoking node C certificate, but you could also do things like remove from SSH authorized keys or cordon and, and drain the node using Kubernetes or you know shut down VPN um, access, uh, have the other nodes remove it from, from their uh, VPN peers or you know adding or removing uh, IP table firewall rules. So all those types of actions are possible and we're working on sort of creating a collection of those rules that will be easily um, usable by everybody. What, so let's let's move into current work on, on Keylime. So the agent, the Keylime agent, is currently in Python. It's being ported to Rust, and uh, work is as good is uh, is underway on that, and it's moving forward. Um, so for those who are interested in, in why we're using Rust, well, it's a low-level, performance, perf quite performance systems language, and it has been designed with security in mind, which fits Keylime pretty well. And also, we have another issue: is that um, Python. Uh, in the current setup, it ends up uh, pulling quite a lot of dependencies using uh, pip. And this is not always an option, especially for systems that are immutable, um, like CoreOS, um, Red Hat CoreOS, that's, that's not quite possible. So we would be interested in, in moving something else for that. And once it's done, uh, our default agent will be the Rust agent. Um, other work we're engaging in is um, an IMA, so um, the, um, the Integrity Measurement Architecture. Can um, can also be extended to you to do namespaces, which are used very much by containers. So once we have that in place, we'll be able to do measurement inside containers, which will also be an interesting positive development. Lastly, uh, the work for the future, um, we have some on on VTPM, so virtual TPMs. Um, that's if, if from a purely security standpoint currently, a virtual TPM is not very interesting because it's not based on any hardware. So it means that it can it can uh, provide fake quotes and security wise, that's pretty useless. However, for testing reasons, it's already interesting to have it. But in the future, what we'd really like is to have what is called nested quotes, which is where a virtual TPM 
that is inside a container is oh, put I had another slide after this is uh, actually based on a um, on a hardware TPM. So it actually the quotes the virtual TPM gets are actually based on the quotes from the physical TPM. And so using that chain, we would then be able to have virtual uh, TPMs inside containers that would still be useful. Wise. So that's some of the next one of the next things we're working on. Right. So beyond all this technical um, um, stuff, we also have a quite a nice community working on the project. Um, for a start, it's multi-vendor, so that that's always really nice. We have people from Red Hat, as you know, but also from MIT, some people at IBM, uh, people at Netflix and ZTE, people, some independent contributors um, who are also working on the project. And we also don't have just developers; we also have other people working on UX, uh, working on outreach, and everything. So that's really quite nice. The community is friendly. We meet. We have a Slack room on the CNCF Slack. Everybody is very welcome to join, ask questions, um, take uh, you know Keyline for a test a spin, and see how it grows. Um, we also have a lot of automated testing. Um, we have we do code quality assessments, and we try and be pretty supportive of new contributors. There's a guide, uh, and there's a lot of help available if you need it. So with that said, please don't hesitate to try at Keyline. Uh, come and join us if you want to have a chat, and we are now open for any questions you might have. So um, thanks for that, I, and I think and, and thank you, um, Luke, also for joining this. It, the um, the work that you guys are doing to port um, from Python to Rust, um, what I, what is the um, like currently? It you should be are you where are you testing currently? So um, if if you if you're running with Kubernetes, if you're are you not able to run um, tests now on RHEL Core OS, or is that a is it just a lot of dependencies um, and that's yeah. why you're moving off? Yeah, sure. So, so um, a core OS it has a, a read-only nature. Okay, that's not to say you can't use RPM OS tree and so forth, but they also have um, a stripped-down version of Python. Okay, I can't remember the actual yeah. name, but I think it's System Python. And uh, currently, the Python agent has a big list of dependencies that are pulled in, okay? And um, <clears throat> with Rust, it's statically linked. So when you compile it, all of your dependencies are in a single blob, okay? So that just means it's less disruptive to an OS tree-like operating system just to have a, a single binary OS tree. So th that's one of the reasons that it makes a Rust implementation more conducive to uh, container operating system like Fedora Core OS, Red Hat Core OS. And uh, it was actually the um, Fedora Core OS uh, community that, that yeah. was encouraging us to do this work as well. So there's, that's the one aspect is we don't have a big pool of dependencies to pull in. Yeah. And um, secondly, um, the Rust client is, because it's, it's a low level language, we can be a bit more, uh, less resource hungry. It could be, the performance is arguably better, I, I would say. And, um, and then the security, not to make a statement that Python is not secure, but because of uh, Rust's uh, strict adherence to scope and ownership, it means that a lot of our possible security debt is paid at compilation time rather than being discovered later. So those are the sort of the, the free motivators. But um, I, I guess, um, and that's good. And I, and I have a vested interest. My Twitter handle is Python DJ, so I'm just showing my mm. bias here. However, I, sure. I am one of the co-chairs for the OKD working group, which is running on Fedora Core OS. So I was... Mm. So I, I've been balancing sure. my so, Python yeah, love, yeah. my Fedora of course, Core OS yeah. love. Mm, I understand. So, so, so with Keyline, you've got a trinity of systems. You have the agent, which runs on the machine that you want to measure. Okay, that's remote to you, so you're performing a remote attestation. We've got two services: the verifier and the register, an integral part. Those tend to be a little bit more on-premise, and those are all 
developed in Python and, and they will remain in Python yeah. for the foreseeable. We've no plans to move from Python there. And we also plan to continue to keep the Python agent going because it allows us to prototype a lot quicker. Um, so yes, it's kind of it's for us. Um, I would say if you looked at our entire code base, it's about twenty percent that's going to run. The majority of it's staying in point. So um, I guess, and, and pardon my naivety, um, sometimes in these things. So you you're using this. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that MIT and IBM and Netflix and all of these folks were were um, participating in this, where are you at in terms of being production ready? Um, I know this is sandbox, so I know that's a, you know, a leading question, but um, sure. what, what is sort of the status of it? So we're, we're um, so as it relates to OpenShift, we're working on a developer preview. And um, that will be coming the end of this quarter. And uh, so this is deeper integration with Fedora Core S. And then that will naturally percolate to OpenShift as well. So what we're doing initially is looking at securing the infrastructure for when you deploy your, your workers and so forth, your OpenShift cluster. It will ensure that it's deployed to an infra that has the, the expected state. So nobody's tampered with that environment. Okay. So, so we're looking at um, a developer preview at the end of this quarter. And then we'll move, hope, hopefully move to a tech preview and GA, and a possible date is this. Don't hold me to this. Is is sort of fall twenty one, okay? And uh, so initially we're looking to establish um, trust station for the infrastructure, mm -hmm. but then we will look at ways that we can bring that up into uh, Kubernetes, where scheduler can start to operate with key Lyman and other components as well, a cluster manager and so forth. So, um, so and this, this again, I'm wearing my OKD working group um, hat. Sure. Um, so, when, so if we get four six out the door, four seven out the door, will it be testable with um, um, OKD, um, which is running on Fedora Core OS in the not too distant future? So, where where are your POCs going right now? Are they running on um, vanilla Kubernetes and on what underlying immutable? Is it so so at the moment it's with uh, it's um just fedora core os so what's happening is um some folks from fedora core os are working on a change to introduce so so keyline uh, requires measurements of a file so a measurement is a sha256 digest of a file okay mm -hmm. and then what happens is those digests cryptographically signed and they're sent from the agent to the verifier and the verifier will then make a comparison between what is the state on the machine and what is the expected state if there's a change you know somebody's tampered with it so if it's for example we're measuring uh sbin ip tables okay mm -hmm. that has a that has a hash of xyz on the verifier, which is not on the target machine, this is on-premise, uh, that expects the file state to be ABC. So obviously there's a, there's a discrepancy suggesting that somebody's tampered with that binary, perhaps they've trojanized it, okay? Mm -hmm. So for us to get these hashes, what we're looking at doing is, and this is a proof of concept at the moment, is uh, OS tree and brew, the build system, will automatically pass out these hashes from OS tree and construct a list for every OS tree release, okay? That list will then be signed. And then Keyline, when you, when you run Keyline, you can tell which version of OS tree you want to measure. Keyline will make a call in, retrieve the list for that particular release of OS tree, uh, perform like a GPG verification to make sure it's, it's signed and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then it will then send it to the verifier, who will then measure the the target node where our workload is running to make sure that it has that exact version of, of OS tree that's running. 
And then at that juncture, once we have that proof of concept in place, then we'll look at how this can be leveraged by, uh, for example, OpenShift, Kubernetes, to then be part of, um, uh, for example, somebody might have an application which they're going to run in a container and they're going to run it on somebody else's machine effectively. So they can then also query for the trust state of that machine because, because we measure the initial boot of the system, but we also measure it continuously for runtime as well. So that way, if you are somebody that wants to deploy an application onto OpenShift that you deem to have a security context that's strong. There's a strong requirement for privacy and security res resilience and so forth. But then you'll be able to call in to make sure the trust state of that node is sound before you then schedule and, and run your, your, your pod there, so to say. So we've, we've also done some demos where we had a demo recently where we had uh, two worker nodes okay, and a controller. Uh, a, and a pod running on one of the worker nodes. We we hack this comp this uh, worker node. Okay, that hack was instantly picked up by Keyline, who they made a call into the controller to cordon and drain the pod from the compromised worker node onto a known good worker node. And then the, the kind of the, the the good bit about the demo was it was a seamless experience for the for the application owner see their pod migrate across from a, a compromised node to a, to a known good node. So that, that's the sort of the, the cool thing that you can do with Keyline is you can measure a machine, but then as soon as a machine fails, you can tell other machines, controllers and so forth, to effectively shut down and ring fence compromised machine and migrate your workloads to a machine which is still showing that it's tamper free, if you see what I mean. So how do you, um, so just, I'm getting my head around it. All right, mm. it's, a bit, it, it's, yeah. it's a bit low level for what Diane normally works on. And mm. I'm really happy you're working on it because it sounds mm. like we need it, especially with you can demo hack and a worker note. Um, uh, that's, that's probably not, not the best thing to know about um, for me. But um, how is this going to, uh, how do you see this surfacing in say the, the dashboard of OpenShift, or is this like something that we add into our notifications? Um, how is how is the visualization of how this will integrate into our current experience of OpenShift? Sure. So, so you're very much seeing a, a work in progress here. Those are discussions that are happening at the moment. So, with Keyline, uh, this is uh, so it's in the office of it's in the CTO office. It's sort of what we consider emerging tech at the moment. So at the moment, we're, we're talking to lots of folks around where Keyline will be situated within the different technologies. So my, my guess is that Keyline will be quite early in the process of the cluster being deployed, okay? Because it needs to measure that the infrastructure is sound. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to Keyline continuously monitoring, and how that's rendered onto a dashboard. That's something that we still need to to uh, to work out. So I can't see it being a challenge. It's just yeah. getting consensus around how do we do that. Yeah, and, and yeah. working with, working with the, the UX team and figuring out how to expose that. And also yeah. to do it in a way that anyone who's running generic Kubernetes can also do it. Um, yeah, very much, yeah. And there's, there's lots of considerations because there's with Keyline, you saying that you trust a system is based on what we call a hardware root of trust. So you have this trusted platform module, the TPM, okay? And, um, and the TPM is almost like a, a very simple version of OpenSSL. It can, it can create keys and it can sign things. And that sort of signs these measurements within the TPM. And then when you get that, list back you can you can use that hardware route of trust to know that it's an actual machine that you've spoken to it's not somebody pretending to be that machine and feeding you false information so what you have to be a little bit careful of is when you render that onto a dashboard then if you're 
put in that state into something like a MySQL database, which is then being pulled into a React.js JavaScript framework and put on a browser, then what you're seeing as something saying something's good, you've kind of got a lot of intermediate components between the hardware trust and what's the trust that's been rendered to the user, if you see what I mean. So that's where we have to make sure when we do that, we have to make sure that somebody doesn't compromise the the journey from that hardware based trust to somebody seeing something in a browser, if you see what yeah. where you've got, you know, where, yeah, you, so where you have um, CSS and JavaScript and, you know. So this is um, at, at a, cause, because of where it work, where this level of verification is going on, it has a lot of implications for edge and IoT, I would suspect. As well. Very much, yeah, very much. So a, a big thing behind Keyline is is a big push because of Edge and IoT. So when we showed this solution to um, uh, the Linux Security Summit and the Edge and IoT Summit, there was a lot of interest around the project there because it's incredibly good for. Uh, let, let me rephrase that: incredibly good to incredibly suited for machines that are physically in locations that can easily be tampered with. So for example, if somebody's got a an IoT device, which is um, in a roof of a building somewhere, then it's, it's, it's hard to sort of protect that machine compared to when it's in a, a big data center with a, a big security guard on the door, you know, checking badges and so forth. So one, there was somebody that used Keylime in the Raspberry Pi community because they had a camera on their garage door, which read their number plate using machine learning. And then if it picked up their number plate, it made a, a logic control signal to the, uh, to the automated door mechanism to raise the garage door. Okay. And um, they use Keylime to protect that Raspberry Pi so that if somebody messed with it to try and break into their garage, then they would sort of cut off the connection so that it couldn't call the door to open. And so it, it does really lend itself well to, to Edge and IoT. Cool. So you so also- That's one of the- Yeah. So the other, the other piece, you also mentioned um, that Mass Open Cloud was, um, was participating in this and doing a POC. So are they using it? Not the POC, no, they're using, they're using Keyline. So what they use Keyline for is uh, if somebody owns a machine and they give it back and they want to give it to another person, they don't want to, they had this use case that was particular to them where they didn't want to entirely re reinstall the whole operating system and the hypervisor and everything again, okay? So what they do is they instead use Keyline to make sure that the person's not compromised the machine with something nasty before they release it to go to someone else. So this this has tons of applications outside of Kubernetes and cloud native as well. So this is like it, much, sits yeah. on, it sits on the edge of is this a cloud native project or is this a uh, just a damn fine security thing that we should all sure. be using? Yeah, very much, yeah. So when we originally spoke to the Linux Foundation, that was the question was, was you know, we were thinking we could put this in LF Edge, it could be in, it could be in CNCF, it could be in, you know, it could be its own project as such. So we, we landed on CNCF just because we were doing a lot of our work around Kubernetes initially, but there's, there's you know, this really is conducive to, to Edge and IoT as well. So coincidentally, sort of, I guess going off OpenShift a little bit as a topic, but Fedora IoT are, are yeah. actively working on the project with us. I would, I would suspect Peter Robertson would have picked up on this. Yeah, I was on a really call with Peter finish. earlier. Yeah, Peter's yeah. quite familiar with Keyline. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, if you wanted to get, uh, I, I'm going to make you share Axel maybe your screen one more time and go to the Keyline. Um, landing page because it's a different it has a different extension than a lot of the other ones I think 
because key lime yes, is dot, so dot dev dot dev uh, and maybe go to um when your community yeah, meet, you community let me see meeting. if i can do that yeah see if you can share that and um because that would be good just for people to see you you know where you're at because that took me a minute or two i think i got somebody else's key lime recipe page um the first time i googled you all and um not that i cook but you know it looked good um this mm. looks better <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So I have to. I have to be honest with you. I've never. I've never actually baked a key lime. But um, let me know if you can see this page. I can indeed. Um, and okay. And you have. So we you are have, key lime uh, Yeah. Sorry. That's that's good to know. And um, if people want to, how do they find out when your um, community meetings are happening? Where is that schedule? So there's a lot of information on the GitHub. I'm not sure that's that that's should right. be somewhere in the guide. Um. Oh, if you go to the meetings repo, you'll see it, Axel. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Cool. And I and I would tell you also, um, when uh, when we get the updates to Fedora Core OS for this to all work, um, I would love you guys to come to the OKD working group meeting, which is on Tuesdays, and um come and talk about it with that because there's been some conversations between the Fedora IoT, Fedora Core OS, and the OKD working group about um, using OKD on the edge. It's not there yet and we don't have really the resources um, beyond getting our releases out right now, but there's been a, there's actually quite a few people there who are interested in this space that probably could help um, test it for you, um, especially with OKD. Um, being running on Fedora Core OS. So I think that might give you a, a first test bed for OpenShift um, that might help. And um, that I'd be, I'd be thrilled to see that see that collaboration happen between the two work or three working groups, you know, Keylime, Fedora Core OS, and OKD. Um, that might be a, a, a great breeding ground for some more um, contributors to this project. So um, hopefully that. So, what else should I be asking that I'm not asking? I, I you know, what, what's the thing uh, you, you haven't, you stumped me because now I have to go out and play with this um, and, and watch you guys uh, grow this community. Um, but uh, what, what is it that, uh, that I should have asked that I haven't asked? The, one of the concerns we often get is, but so how many nodes can you have? Like, can you get 10? Can you get 100? I mean, that's usually the, one of the questions that comes up quite fast. So currently we know that it can scale up to thousands. Um, so with one verify, you can check a thousand, several thousand machines. And I think Luke, you think it can go quite a bit further uh, from what we have as info. So that's one of the questions we often get. The other thing as well, um, with Keyline, you get the impression that it might be all these complex protocols and raw network connections. It's not. Everything talks over a REST API. So, so all of these services and the agent, it's all plain REST. So, so it's um, the 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 only sort of slightly arcane part is where we talk to the hardware, but the rest of it is very much a, a kind of a modern approach to developing a web service. So we, we have some stuff coming in where we we're currently using a mutual TLS, but we're also introducing JSON web tokens. Looking at um, you know integrating with other projects as well around uh, bringing Keylime being easier to authenticate with Keylime and so single sign on and so. We have a bunch of yeah. Also, so, also, yeah. To mention, there is um, if you go to our homepage, there's a demo, and this is Keyline protecting a a three node etcd cluster. So the first five minutes are are me sort of talking about the project, but the second five minutes you'll see there's some terminals. You'll see the actual solution working there. So what we do is we we compromise one of the etcd nodes okay and then the uh it's removed from the cluster and we delete some ssh keys new actions 
All right. So, I mean, that, that's what, yeah, that's one of the good things with Keylime is this revocation framework. You can, anything that you can dream up of writing in Python, Keylime will run for you. So, for example, if a machine fails, you want, you might want all of the other machines to update an IP tables rule. You just write a simple Python script in IP tables, and then Keylime will securely transfer that to the machines and, and it'll be securely run on those machines only when a signed event comes. That way you can sort of uh, ring fence a machine. So, so in a way, it's, it's got a very nice open framework for, for being quite creative with what to do when a machine fails. Yeah, I can, this is, it, it, there's so many ramp, different use cases for this. Um, I'm, in mm. my head, I'm, I'm going to like anybody who's a cloud hosting provider who's supplying servers and, you know, GPUs and HPC uh, machines and needs, you know, for secured, you know, compliant systems, there's going to be a lot of um, interesting use cases that come up in the next um, little while. So it'll be interesting to see mm. how this plays out um, and where, you know, I'm glad it's in the cloud native Computing Foundation, frankly, because I probably would mm. not have heard about it until it surfaced somewhere in OpenShift and upcoming mm. releases. But um, that would be uh, an interesting use case. I'm curious to see, you know, when people ask for this kind of attestation um, from their cloud hosting providers. I could mm. see see them saying, "Yeah, this is really running whatever you know, Fedora Core OS, blah blah, the, this version, or it's running." you know, uh, RHEL core OS, or it's running whatever other um, immutable operating system. This is, it's really, um, I think, an integral part of the puzzle for people to really trust um, Kubernetes um, at a high scale um, and yeah. to get into those high security um, yeah, customers or end users scenarios as well. So that's, it's always been an interesting um, aspect of yeah. Kubernetes. Yeah. There's a very interesting aspect of, of Keylime, which is to sort of move uh, the root of trust um, away from basically just the sort of the social trust you have in your cloud provider and the promise that they're not, you know, going to mess things up in the background, and moving that to actual hardware root of trust, is which is based in silicon, which is a different type of, a type of trust, but for some cases it's it's much more useful, or it's it feels stronger and it is stronger in in many cases for many actors, as you were pointing out. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, we've just done. Be, I should be should think that the hardware providers would be very interested in this as well. Um, and you know, like we do a lot of work with Nvidia and other folks and people who make chips and things along that nature. I'm curious to see how they um, inter be become aware. Hopefully, they'll watch this and become aware of the project and see if they can um, help. Uh, move it forward as well. So um, kudos to you guys for getting it this far, um, going from mm -hmm. a paper at MIT, um, which we'll put the link up and I'll, I'll take a, a, a look at that um, myself and hopefully every, other people will, and uh, collaborating with MIT, IBM, and Netflix, and Mass Open Cloud, and everybody else to, to solve their use cases. I'm really going to be looking forward to seeing how this um, comes into the OpenShift release, so come back, please, um, when that that hits. Come to the OKD working group when um, when you're ready, um, and or even if you just want to expose this, I will share with them this the video that we're making today, um, and we'll we'll make sure that um, there it's on their radar because um, I think that's on. And there's also a lot of um, security folks that are part of OpenShift Commons that I think will be very interested in this as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing and helping you guys grow this community. And I'm you know, totally thrilled that you've gotten to Sandbox. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes to incubate you guys and maybe get you to be an official one. And if you end up being officially in CNCF or if you find um, that you are playing more on the edge in the IoT space so, um, and, and need more of a generic home, but um, I think the Kubernetes community is going to really appreciate this and um, embrace it. So um, I'm looking forward to that. The other question I have for you guys is, um, 
well, there's actually there's one came in. Does Key Lime act at the pod level also to ensure pod security and not only at the infra VM level? That's sorry, once again. It's in the chat there. Um, oh, okay. Does Key Lime act at pod level also? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, as far as measuring trust within a container, this is something that we're looking at. And um, what we need to do is, to, as you would have seen earlier mentioned, that we use something called IMA in the Linux kernel, which is used to measure. So what happens is when a syscall is made, IMA will measure the object that's, that's requesting that system call. So IMA sits alongside SE Linux, in the Linux security subsystem. So what will happen is, if you run a script as root, that will be measured. It will be put into the TPM, signed, and then sent to the remote verifier to verify. Okay. Now, for us to get that to work in a container, we need an IMA namespace, and we're actively working on that, as are some people in the Linux kernel. So we fully anticipate being able to do this same level of trust measurement within a within a pod, if a pod is essentially a container. So yes, yeah, so our plan is to provide the same level of measurement within a container as what we do for the infra. But we have to just wait for this IMA namespace to land in the Linux kernel first. Well, that, and the but yeah, that's, that for us is, that's the, 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 that's the, the crown jewels that we want to get as well be able to measure in a container. And the, the ETA for it landing in the um, Linux kernel namespace? I, I, w I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Things get discussed a lot on the Linux kernel mailing list, so, so we're just trying to sort of brush out an agreement and, and alleviate any sort of points of contention that always do come up on the Linux kernel if you're trying to get something like that. This, this level of a change, yeah, or yeah. inclusion. So um, I know KubeCon is coming up um, soon, November 17th. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any um, birds of a feather or meetings or any back? Uh, did you get any space at KubeCon or? We, did, we didn't, unfortunately, no, no. Too soon, I think. Maybe you were just too recently added to the sandbox? Yes, yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, it was um, well, Axel was it a six weeks ago or? It was really recent. I yeah, know. yeah, something like that. It was very, very recent. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, well, then what we'll just have to do is make sure everybody shows up at your Wednesday meetings um, and continue to to push people to to come and find you. Um, yeah, we we um, there's there's lots to do. We're we're a pretty happy, friendly community. So, you know, um, that we have a policy of there's no stupid questions when you're standing up key line, you know, and um, so, yeah, you'll find us on the CNCF Slack. So there's, there's always, you know, people chatting on there. All right. Yeah, and I was going to add, um, I mean, Diana and everybody else, if you if you find new cool ways of using key line, you know, don't hesitate to come and, and share them. I mean, it's a fun, it's a fun thing to think about how you can use this in ways that might not have been initially intended. Uh, but can actually be useful, so don't hesitate. Well, I think the Raspberry Pi garage opener example use case is probably my favorite of the day. So, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> so that I think that'll be that'll be interesting. We have a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis around my house, so um, hopefully um, we'll we'll do that one in our spare time, um, yeah. which we all have so much of. So. Uh, uh, I was going to say uh, one more time to the audience out there, if you have other questions, please speak up, throw them in the chat. Um, we'll give you a couple more seconds, um, and then we're going to let you guys go back to um, making key lime pies or um, key lime rusted or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I have no puns left today. It's been a long weekend. Um, and um, when when you get the Fedora CoreOS things in, please ping me. Um, and we will have you back, and we'll have you back with the OKD Working Group as well. Um, and maybe, just maybe, um, we can stand up a couple of um, examples of this and, and have the demo run with OKD. 
which would be one of my um, happy days as well. So um, yeah, I would really get behind that and help get that get that running with you. Yeah. yeah. I think that that would be a great um, maybe a sub spin off group from the OKD working group because I know there's a lot of interest and a good and we're really thrilled about the collaboration between the Fedora Core West and the OKD community. There's a lot of cross pollination there. So um, hopefully we can we can make something happen for you as well as um, other Kubernetes folks out there as well. This is something that um, I, I should hope we can get into the slipstream upstream of Kubernetes sooner than later, um, though everything takes time, especially when it's this low level. So here's to um, hoping the Linux kernel folks um, listen to you and um, incorporate your requests and get you moving down the path soon. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks, for, thanks for having us. Happy thank Monday, you. everyone. And thank um, you. take care. Bye-bye.